providers or commissioners. There are certain organisational uh, factors that reduce the accessibility of screening programmes. So within the survival screening programme, as I've mentioned before, within London, uh, there generally is a shortage of sample takers, uh, well, practice nurses who take the samples from women. Uh, these are generally practice nurses who've been trained to take cervical samples. And um, I understand that the practice um, nursing profession is aging, they're declining in number. So it is quite difficult in some parts of London to actually get a cervical screening appointment at a time that suits you. Um, so there, there, there is the issue of um, accessibility, and I've talked about the patient contact details. Um, all of our mail tend to use Royal Mail and there is quite a significant percentage of mail that, get, that gets lost. Um, and I've talked about test acceptability. So some of these tests that we offer within the screening programs, our population don't find acceptable. So uh, NHS England has been working uh, quite hard since 2013 to improve uptake and coverage. Um, and I've listed here um, what we've done to improve the uptake of all cancer screening programs. So we have invested quite significant amounts uh, uh, of money uh, to our providers using a variety of contractual levers to improve participation. But also we are working in partnership with cancer alliances, with voluntary sector, with academics um, to uh, improve participation uh, and also working with the Healthy London Partnership. We are involved in quite a lot of research which uh, I have um, uh, listed here. And a lot of the research that we've funded, we've then, where it's found to be effective, we've then gone on to, to commission uh, some of those interventions. And I think the breast screening program is probably the best example of where NHS England has commissioned evidence-based interventions that have actually had a population impact. So uh, we've been implementing text reminders since 2015. Um, so every woman who is participating, who's invited to breast screening, gets a text reminder if you are what 72 hours before she is due to attend. And this largely explains why London is the only region that's had uh, an increase in coverage uh, for the past two years, at least to March uh, 17. And it's been very effective in places like Merton and in other boroughs as well. Um, and uh, there, are, there are other things in breast screening which I have listed there, but I won't necessarily go into detail. In terms of uh, bowel screening, um, for some years now, the London Bowel Screening Hub has been working with GPs to support local incentive schemes, to support practices, um, uh, contact the non-responders, so people who don't actually return their kits. Uh, and this has had uh, mixed success, I'd say, mixed success um, uh, across London. But, uh, but as I said before, in Merton, uh, we have seen a 1% increase uh, in coverage in the 1674 homes. Um, so I think probably the most exciting change that is going to be introduced within the bowel screening programme is the change to the screening test itself. Um, it's going to change from the current test, which is called a uh, fecal occult blood test, FOBT, to FIT. And uh, this FIT test, um, when it was piloted in London, actually increased, was found to increase uptake by between 7 and 9 percent. Uh, this is due to be introduced uh, in London in December, and it will be completely rolled out by March next year. So the increase we saw in uh, FIT, in bar screening uptake when it introduced FIT, we saw increase in uh, groups that have a lower uptake. So in men, uh, in, uh, in um, the younger uh, age group, and in deprived, and people from in deprived quintiles. So the introduction of FIT in quarter four is going to close the gap uh, or reduce the inequalities that we see in bowel screening uptake. It won't take us, London or Merton, to 60%, but it will uh, take us very close to 60%. So, uh, in terms of cervical screening, we are doing quite a lot of work with a variety of partners uh, to uh, improve access. So, the Royal Marsden Partners, a partnership which is the Cancer Alliance that covers Merton, um, has been piloting um, the uh, offering of cervical screening within primary care hubs, targeting uh, women who are overdue screening. And we within NHS England are commissioning sexual health clinics as well to offer cervical screening in 2018-19. Uh, we are introducing a big change to the cervical screening program. So currently the test uh, is, is a cytological test where you take 
a sample from a woman and you look at it under a microscope. But this test is going to change to HPV testing. And this is a significantly more accurate test. And um, it, it, is a, a, it, it is more predictive of a woman's risks of developing cancer or not developing cancer if she uh, is negative. And we expect that to be rolled out by December 2019. The uh, big difference that the committee should uh, note is that the introduction of HPV primary screening within the circle screening program um, is going to result in us reducing the number of psychology laboratories in London from 10 to 1. So we're going to have a big procurement. It's, uh, it's been coordinated uh, nationally, but there will be one laboratory uh, which will cover the whole of London. Um, in September 2018, we've, uh, so just the past month, we uh, introduced uh, GP endorsed text reminders uh, to all women invited for cervical screening. And uh, this is a highly effective intervention. The evidence shows that this will increase um, uptake uh, participation rates by um, 4%. So at a London-wide level, 25,000 more women will participate in screening. And at uh, Merton levels, uh, possibly 1,000 more women will participate uh, uh, in screening every year. Uh, in terms of provider performance, uh, the providers that I've mentioned are generally performing well. Um, there are a few issues at St. Helier's related to their cytology lab. So this is the lab that processes the cervical screening samples. Um, there is a shortage of the workforce that processes the, the, these samples, that examines these samples. But uh, this is uh, an issue that's well on the way to um, remediation, as I've described uh, uh, on the, uh, in the report. Um, St. George's, the colposcopy service, um, is also undergoing some uh, performance issues largely relating to staffing pressures. But again, uh, we've implemented a remedial action plan. So we'd anticipate um, them to be achieving the national targets around performance within the next um, two to three months. <coughs> um, on the last page of the report, I've given some background to the breast screening um, uh, incident, which uh, you may be aware of. Um, the, I want the Commission to be assured that in London, our breast screening units responded extremely well, and uh, we have actually been able to offer appointments to all the women that were affected. And uh, we are expecting a national report on the, uh, on, on the entire incident and the root causes of the incident uh, by December next year. So, um, targets but there's a lot of work uh, being undertaken in partnership to address uh, to address this and we are beginning <coughs> to see the impact of the work that we've done since we did it. Thank you. Bagma, do you want to add? Yeah. Um, so the, the micro doesn't work but um, and I think um, and you understand. So first of all many things. <laughs> yeah so um, many thanks to um, Josephine for um, um, coming here and presenting the results. I just wanted to briefly remember, um, remind the committee that on the 5th of September we brought a cover paper that actually explained our local authority oversight duty around cancer screening and flu vaccination. And um, it is important to understand how we work collaboratively with NHS England and Public Health England and what the role of the council is, because you as members were very interested to find out what can we do to help um, 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 improve these services. And um, um, so that's just a, um, a little reminder. Um, the local authority has only got an oversight um, in function. That is why I'm very um, grateful um, to Josephine to come here, because for me, um, um, to comply with the oversight function, I have to hold to account NHS England and Public Health England. And I think it's um, really fair to say that um, um, we are very much um, trying to collaborate um, to improve the um, situation. So examples are, I haven't got any um, bespoke resource for campaigning, but you will have come across 
national campaigns that we then channel through our local comms. We have also some um, more innovative schemes um, wherever possible we use them as hooks. So with the fire service, for example, um, we give them um, materials um, and health promotion um, information. Um, and so um, there is the absolute commitment and will to collaborate as much as possible. The one thing I wanted to draw attention to and, and possibly ask Josephine to comment is but obviously, as a borrower, we take our inequalities really seriously and we understand them very well. We have got um, a clear East-West um, division for all sorts of health and um, social factors. And we did a little quick and dirty analysis of the variation around GP practices. And although you are absolutely right, the catchment areas um, in, in are quite wide. Um, there is a clear picture um, of differential between East and West in terms of practice um, and coverage. And so I'm very encouraged because I've been working with your colleagues from Public Health England as well that there is a strategy out at London level um, to focus on the underserved populations. And I would like you to help us a little bit um, to find out what more could be done to offer the same choice and opportunities to all of our residents. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks. Thank you. I have a couple of questions on um, cervical screening and HPV. Um, firstly, the new um, HPV test, is that a less invasive test than the smear test? Is it just a blood test? Or are you still doing the smear? That's the first question. It's so it's a smear, still a smear. Still a smear. Yeah. Um, and secondly, how does this link with the HP, HPV vaccination programme? And will we still call women for screening if they've had the HPV vaccine, for instance, while they were at school? Uh, so um, the National Screening Committee that sets uh, screening policy is actually up to consultation on this exact point. Um, what we expect is that as these vaccinated girls enter screening age, uh, the uh, incidence of HPV will be very, very low. So um, what we, what the NSC is proposing is that instead of screening women under, 40, under 50 every three years, we'll actually only have to screen them every five years. So we do expect that the cervical screening um, incident, sorry, the cervical cancer incident is going to decline significantly as these girls enter screening age, as more of them are enter screening age. And the programme itself, if the consultation passes and this enter screening policy will change dramatically. So we'll only be screening women every five years as opposed to every three years for women under 15. Thank you, and thank you for your report. I've got a question about um, general coverage and uptake over screening. You mentioned that it's impacted largely by deprivation and by diversity, but the interventions that you mentioned are largely quite universal rather than targeted, and I wondered whether there were any targeted interventions that you were looking at, or any specific sort of financial incentives such as well. So um, as uh, NHS England, um, we tend to focus on uh, interventions that can be delivered to scale across London uh, that are uh, efficient in terms of commissioning, so they can be commissioned by a small team. So these tend to be large interventions that can be delivered by a small number of providers. Um, so they aren't necessarily target targeted to specific populations, but we do know that certain interventions uh, are more effective in, um, in the more deprived groups. So as I've mentioned, things like FIT are more in terms of uptake, and uptake will increase in people who, are, who traditionally are less likely to participate in the bowel screening programme. But also text reminders as well. Um, there is evidence to suggest that text reminders and the screening programmes are more effective in people from deprived groups. And actually, when you look at the percentage of mobile phones that are registered within, the, uh, within GP, um, uh, within the GP clinical system, people from deprived quintiles have a high, a higher proportion of them have mobile phones registered with their GP. So these interventions tend to be more effective. And um, the theory behind that is that people from deprived backgrounds are less likely to have a landline. Uh, but, um, but we aren't completely sure of that. But the various randomized control trials have shown that text reminders or suggest that text reminders are more effective. Um, uh, and people from deprived groups. 
Um, in terms of the partnership working that I have uh, mentioned before, quite a few of our partners, like Community Links, which is a community organisation targeting people from South Asian communities uh, uh, in particular, we have commissioned them to um, deliver targeted uh, interventions in places like Camden and Islington and Tower Hamlet Senior. But quite a few of our partners, Joe's Trust, which is a survival cancer charity, uh, um, uh, also work with specific groups. Now, uh, in terms of um, CCGs, are the ones who commission incentive schemes, and uh, we formed a cancer screening uptake improvement board to ensure that, uh, or to try to be more coordinated in the work that is being done, uh, and to ensure that we have joint priorities, but most importantly, a uh, joint understanding of where the need lies and possibly where targeting would be uh, most effective. Thank you for your report. Um, if I may hear properly, you said there's only one lot for the testing. Of, um, I just want to find out how <coughs> um, accurate will this report be and how um, often will the result be implemented? Um, so, in terms of reducing the number of labs, this will come into effect next year. So, um, we will we'll start probably between July 19 and December 19. We're going to reduce the number of labs. So, currently in London, we, we have nine labs in London, and there are some samples that go to um, to, to a lab in Surrey. Uh, but in terms of the standards uh, that we expect the lab to meet, in terms of turnaround times and processing times. These will remain the same and they've been specified by NHS England and by Public Health England. So there shouldn't be um, any delays to them receiving the results letter. And HPV, because it is an automated <coughs> test, unlike cytology, which means people to look at these samples under the microscope, we expect that the processing times will, um, labs will quite easily meet the processing times. And uh, as I say, the standards will remain, uh, you know, will remain the same in terms of turnaround times. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm struggling a little bit to understand the scale of the issue we're discussing. Um, it seems to me that where we have a target, say, of 70%, we achieve 68%, that doesn't actually sound too bad. But then it occurs to me, well, if people have missed the screening, they are perhaps being delayed in receiving treatment for perhaps cancerous conditions, or may not indeed get any treatment until it's too late. <coughs> I just wondered whether there were any estimations of the, the magnitude, the kind of scale, the life years lost or monetary cost of treatment as a result of missing a target by a few percent. Um, so there is quite a lot of uh, data, I guess, firstly, that shows the effectiveness of the screening program. So for example, Bowel screening reduces mortality by 16% in, in the eligible population. But also, we now have uh, data at a national and uh, a London and uh, STP level, which shows the survival advantage. So, for example, um, I don't remember the exact figures, um, that people who are detected by the screening route have a significantly better survival, whether it's one year or five years, than people who are diagnosed through other routes. This includes the GP urgent pathway, A and E, and so on. So screening does improve survival, but, uh, but also related to that, when you are detected via screening, we are detecting the cancer earlier, and we do have that data, so we're detecting stage one and stage two cancers. Whereas if you're detected via A and E or uh, via some um, uh, um, uh, other route diagnosed, uh, through some other route, these tend to be late stage cancers that have a poorer prognosis. And I'm happy to share the data if the committee um, would find that helpful. We do have this data on survival and um, stage of diagnosis. very much for your report. I found it interesting to read. I'm concerned that in all of your um, data presented, you don't do any statistics by gender or ethnicity. And we found when we did a task group study of diabetes that uh, one particular ethnic group 
and gender were very susceptible to becoming diabetic. So I wondered if you found any research along those lines would help to target particular focus groups or is there no particular focus group? Um, so we have done health equity audits on all the cancer screening programmes in London. Uh, the last ones were in 2014. And uh, in the bowel screening programme, which is the only cancer screening programme which we screen both men and women, um, men definitely have um, a lower uptake in coverage. And I can share the data to 2014. We are in the process of updating uh, this data, um, the, uh, these uh, um, equity audits, particularly bowel and breast. But uh, the data that we have for London shows that men have a low uptake of bowel screening. Uh, and then looking at uh, ethnicity, uh, within the bowel screening program, they don't actually record ethnicity because everything is done by mail, so they send you the kit and they have no way of noting your ethnicity. Uh, within the breast screening program, we do have ethnic, uh, ethnicity data, um, which um, showed actually that there wasn't significant ethnic variation. Uh, in general, um, there, there was a small difference between white British, obviously had the highest uptake, and uh, certain ethnic groups had uh, lower uptake coverage, but the differences weren't that significant. So we are about to rerun that uh, audit. We should have the results within the next uh, three months. Uh, but ethnic variation isn't that significant in the breast screening program. Uh, within the cervical screening program, um, I think that, well, the data that we have on all of these programs is at a thorough level. So, so what we have are correlations that say more diverse boroughs tend to have lower coverage. But at an individual level within the cervical screening program, it is quite difficult to do that analysis because we have to get the data from GP clinical systems. Uh, and, and that's not, it's not impossible, but it's not an easy analysis to do. Um, I think we can assume from what we've seen at a population level and looking at correlations that uh, women from certain ethnic groups are less likely to participate in screening uh, for a whole variety of reasons, whether it's because of understanding of the test uh, and or embarrassment, particularly in women from um, uh, which were the Muslim background, for example. Uh, but we do know from other research that has been done across the country that there are groups that are less likely to participate in cervical screening. Uh, so, um, you know, transgender men who still have a cervix, a lesbian women, women who've had a female genital mutilation or victims of sexual assault. So there is some data out there, but it's not necessarily London specific. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. I don't think there are any more questions. Oh, can't be. You mentioned that the coposcopy department in St George's um, has underperformed partly because of staffing issues. Um, are you able to expand on that a little bit, just to say, uh, expand a little bit more on what the mitigating uh, measures are that are being taken and whether they're uh, just specific to St George's or sort of symptomatic or anything else? and sort of wider trends in the, in the NHS? Um, so our corposity performance across London is generally very, very good. So St George's is uh, probably one of 20-something units. We may have two in London that are breaching. So the issues are specific to St George's. Um, I think it probably has to do with their own capacity planning uh, and uh, planning for staff absences or you know half terms and summer leave and school holidays and that kind of thing. Um, so um, we do have a formal um, process uh, within NHS England for managing poor performance uh, and we have formal escalation routes um, within the trust and also working with the CCG, ones with CCG. Uh, but within this remedial uh, action plan uh, we're looking at things like recruitment to full capacity within a certain time frame. Thank you. So we are asked to comment on the programme. I think we have. So thank you for your presentation and for answering our questions. And, uh, we're very good. Thank you. Right, item 7 is personal independent payment process in Merton, an update on the improvement action plan. And we have Cam uh, from the DWP and his colleague. <coughs> so my name is Richard Jones, I'm the Regional Manager for London East Vena for the Independent Assessment Services. Yeah. Uh, 
and we'd also like Lila to speak uh, about this. I think she's asked to speak. She um, uh, was one of those people who provided uh, the report that we considered when we first uh, reviewed this situation, and I think that was members of this panel found that extremely helpful. So, so who's sorry? Can you're going to introduce the paper um, before us? Yeah. Well, sorry, chair. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think we we saw. Sort of albeit a bit late, we did circulate sort of the responses between BWP and um, independent assessment services, so I'm hoping that everyone's had some sort of time to have a look at, look at that. We tried to obviously answer uh, the inquiries that were made to full as full as we could. A number of those inquiries related to independent assessment services. Um, apologies, um, albeit late, my, the, my colleague from Independent Assessment Services, Mary Dunning, actually wasn't well this morning, so my esteemed colleague Richard stepped in at last minute top come. Okay, so Richard's had some time to sort of evaluate um, exactly what's been requested and, and the outputs there. Um, and clearly he's got a lot um, to actually participate within this uh, scrutiny panel because he's actually more involved with the Wandsworth Assessment Centre as well. Um, and I think what we'll do here is if, if, if we um, put it over to Myra to sort of raise her concerns or issues and then we'll go from there if that's okay, Chair. Okay. Well, there was one thing that yeah. when I was reading the papers um, on page 79, I couldn't understand what this attached review was supposed to show me. So, well, no, sorry, Chair. Page 79. Oh, I haven't, I haven't got the, all, all the paperwork. It's a list of postcodes. Oh, right. I think that was just raised as to, we just wanted to sort of confirm from a Merton perspective the various postcodes that are affiliated uh, with Merton. Um, and that's what, uh, that's what was requested when we listed them out there. So obviously they're the individual postcodes within residents within Merton that will be affected by uh, personal independence payment applications. Right. What I don't understand is um, we were saying that we felt barking was a bit far. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, the obvious comment that could be made um, uh, was made. Um, and but this doesn't tell us whether somebody has been sent to Barking, whether they come from CR4 or SW20. So what's the answer to that question? Have people from Merton been sent to Barking? Um, not, not to my knowledge. I haven't had any sort of individual cases, but I'm sure you know, our third party sectors that might have had that. But that would have only been done if, if specifically that there weren't any appointments booked in the near centres. We were trying to get away to make sure that our uh, personal independence payment customers aren't travelling more than necessary time travel, uh, which is 90, 90 minutes from their, their actual home, home address. So I haven't come across anyone recently that I've heard that's been really sent to far away assessment centres. Um, we have obviously tried to make sure that our customers are fully aware that they can actually request an appointment at the near, nearest uh, assessment centres. So they do need to obviously understand the appointment letter that they've actually received and make sure that the appointment is at the relevant assessment centre that they can actually travel to. If not, then we would kindly ask our customers to actually phone in and request one to be made at the nearest assessment centre. I have not come across anything of late. So, um, I think I'd like Lila to come in now. On that, you said the target is to not request anyone travel for longer than 90 minutes yeah. to their appointment um, within London using public transport or public transport. 90 minutes seems an inordinately long time. You can get to central London from here in 45. You could get to Barking in less than 90 minutes from public transport. I think that target needs to come down to an hour, if not lower. Yeah, uh, but this target was agreed with, uh, between our uh, DWP policy team and our national uh, partner agencies as well. So it is quite a high target. But yeah, as you've just as I've clearly said, there is um, shorter travelling distances. But we, we agreed at an um, hour and a half being the sort of uh, higher end of the travel process. Mm -hmm. 
that cannot be changed? Damage. It can do. Um, at the moment, so I've not heard anything that's come from our uh, PIP policy program team to sort of you know, state that that travelling uh, you know, distance or measurement should be good. It can, yeah, I can actually put that through to the uh, policy team to consider as a problem. Steve. Ninety minutes suggests three hours travelling in a day. That seems yeah. totally excessive to me. So, uh, if, if you mind, I'd like to just expand on that. Um, so, from my IAS perspective, um, it is nine minutes. So that's what's coming to us. Um, but we break it down into a, a different aspect. So, for us, we do a mapping system. Um, so, we kind of the way to best describe is it kind of like in rings. So you'll take a postcode and you'll say, right, this is your nearest assessment centre. Can we get you in there? No, then we'll go to the next ring out. If we can't get you in there, we'll go to the next ring out. The maximum we expect someone to travel is 90 minutes. That's not saying that that is what is happening. Um, we always, where possible, try and map people in to, because it's, it's, it's a system generated. So it's, it's not people going in and manually doing it and, and manipulating it. The system will always go nearest first and, and gradually work its way out um, to the point where, right, this is the maximum it can get to based on the mapping system that has been created and agreed with the DWP. So from our perspective, we do absolutely everything possible to keep people in as near as possible um, because at the same time we also appreciate that this process can be quite stressful um, and, and can bring some anxiety along with it. So we try and want to get people seen as relatively as, as quickly as possible through that process. So that's why we do look at that system, because if we just focus solely on a very small area, the likelihood is that some people might not be able to get seen as, as potentially promptly as, as they like. But then that's when we also give them the option to potentially you know, you know, move appointments about. We've, we've mapped people into the, their nearest assessment centre, but then they chose to go further afield. Um, for, for whatever reason, um, so it, it, we certainly try where we can, but it is done on, on that ring process that we, we always start at the nearest and, and gradually work our way out. Um, and that barking is pretty much at the bottom um, of all the Merton postcodes um, that are covered on that list. It pretty much is at the bottom of the list for each uh, assessment. I suppose really what I'm sort of astonished about is that We've heard that somebody was sent from Merton to Barking. We thought that was absolutely Barking. And we, um, like we're kind of asking, did that happen? And people are saying, well, not as far as I know, but I think we need to know, was somebody sent from Merton to Barking? And if you think about the journey from, say, Wimbledon to Barking, you know, or from um, somewhere in Mitchell, us, to Tooting Broadway, Northern Line, um, into where you link up with the District and Circle Line, and then a very long tube ride, and all the intersections that would be involved. If you've got somebody who has a disability, that is excessive. You know, asking an able body person, somebody who was fit and well, to do that would be, I think, for all of us, a bit of a, a bit of a hike. Uh, but somebody in those circumstances, it just seems. Crazy. And yet, now here we are months later and nobody can say for certain did that happen or not. We've been told it did. Uh, that was reported to us, I think, from the report that we received. It seemed extraordinary. We made the comment and still we haven't got confirmation whether it happened or not. So, Chair, um, if we could, uh, or if I could have the actual customer details, you know, maybe I can check that out for you. But I've got no specific example. Um, so I appreciate if I've got the details of that customer, then I can investigate, you know, the reason or did that actually occur, why did it occur, and what was the outcome. Um, did it mean that the individual was then given a, a nearest centre as an appointment, or what I would also uh, envisage is that difficulty in that individual getting that assessment centre and home visit to be considered as well, home consultation. Yeah, and on that point, Maria mentioned, I think, to Lila. That, um, that there was a proposal to do a s assessment in buildings that were familiar to your customers, I think that's what you call them, isn't it? Um, so 
um, kind of the, the, the stress and anxiety of somebody, say for example, with a brain injury, finding somewhere that has sort of um, difficulties with spatial awareness and all of that, and the anxiety of finding a building that they're not familiar with compared to going somewhere that they attend on a regular basis is significant. And you know, that would be a, a good step forward. Is there is there any progress with that? From an ISS perspective, on, on getting additional buildings. Yeah, to, to do them in sort of um, so we, we uh, in in uh, the northern area. Um, so going towards sort of Manchester um, area, we we had a partnership with the NHS. Um, it didn't work because we were very limited on what we we could do. Um, in, in terms of we was given very strict times of when we can have access to the building. Um, we weren't given complete control in terms of managing the facility. Um, for us, all of our assessment centres, um, we make sure they, they adhere to a very high standard. We try our hardest to maintain those. Uh, we've got a contractor in to, to maintain them. As it stands, there is no plan to expand into other areas in, in terms of essentially using some hospital spaces. Um, or, or sometimes I think that they're at a premium as it is the space is there. Now I think what Maria was saying to Lila in response to a specific question was would it be possible or, or it would be possible to do them in voluntary sector buildings. So for example, um, you know, would it be possible to do them in the premises of, um, you know, I don't know if you'd have the facility in, in, in where you work, but yeah, but like there are voluntary sector buildings where people are familiar with and they can, you know, they can find because they know it and they use it on a regular basis. Couldn't it be done there? That's that was the, and it was Maria who suggested that was possible. So, so I think it would be possible. I'm not arguing that. But um, it's not happening. It's not happening at the moment because there's there'd be numerous challenges that that, that come with it. Um, the main one that springs to my mind would be the IT system side of it. We have to use a very secure locked down system so that would be something we'd have to have an agreement with the DWP on because all premises that we use we have to get signed off from the DWP prior to using them. Um, we, we don't just decide we're going to, to pop up somewhere. Um, each one we have to provide um, very extensive details of that building and we have to make sure that every consultation we meet at the minimum requirement and, and so on. So for us it's a possibility um, further down the line. Um, the likelihood of it happening in the near future, I'd say slim, um, given that we are currently in negotiation on, on the contract, and if it does go through, it will only be till 2021 um, with, with us. So I, I, I'd imagine that that it would just wouldn't be feasible in that time to, to make the, the required changes, get the building signed off to, to the spec required. Um, and then everything put in place um, within that time period. So where were you misled? I couldn't comment on what happened last time, but I don't think it's a matter of being misled. Like I said, I think it can happen, but I think it's about, we've got to obviously make sure that everyone's in an agreement and that it works for all parties. It's, like, it's not something that we can just go away and, and do tomorrow. Um, it's not something we can just go away and, and do um, within a very short period of time. It takes that we have to obviously make sure we can find suitable premises, all of ours across London um, are all ground level. Um, there is none that require any access through lifts or anything like that. Um, so it's about making sure we can accommodate all of those needs um, as, as well as um, you know, meeting the payments needs as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was looking at this assessment centre you sent that's in um, Kennington, and it says the centre's um, is it 0.5 of a mile from the tube station. Now the criteria mm -hmm. here in point system, if you can stand and move between 1 and 20 metres without help, or 1 and 20 metres to half a mile, it, it seems to me, if you're sending to these centres, whether aided, and I had my ankle in a boot for the second time, and I could, with help, go on, on a tube and get up in a lift, and I had to get a cab at the other end, because I just couldn't walk any further. Now, if these people are asking for their assessments, 
they haven't got the money to fund camps. And it's almost with the point award system and where you're sending them, it's setting them up to fail. Because, well, if you can get pay, you're fine. Mm -hmm. But then, 87% are overturned on appeal. To me, it seems crazy. I just don't understand the system. So just having yeah. been in a boot, I know what it's like temporarily to have a disability. And I couldn't have managed this trip like that. So I just do not know how anyone with a disability can. So I think, uh, just, just the first thing for me um, that, that stands out is um, it varies on person to person. I don't think we can brand it and say that every single person will struggle. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I think from, from, from my perspective, um, I, I, I travel across London and the east of England um, oh. as the, the regional manager. I spend a lot of time in, in Vauxhall at the Sandcross Street Assessment Centre as my um, base location. <coughs> um, majority of our payments that, that, that come from the assessment centre are able to and we also make sure we do all the necessary checks so we do courtesy calls 24 hours prior as well as send a reminder text message to ensure that people are confident in, in attending the assessment and answer any other questions they may have and provide them any additional insight that they may require into getting to that relevant assessment centre. Um, I think What's also really telling is that we're required by the DWP to to adhere to a custom satisfaction. Um, we, so we're required to, to achieve a minimum of 90% every single month um, in, the, in the individual region. So for, I haven't received October's numbers yet. We, we It's outsourced. It's not done by DWP. It's not done by IAS. We, we outsource that. Um, but for September, of the people we... Um, that was surveyed across London at complete random, 97.6 of them were, were satisfied with, with, with the service that was provided to them and everything that was offered to them. So I think for me that's quite telling. Um, we've had a month in London where actually 100% of the people that we surveyed were satisfied. Um, and, and we don't just look at, you, you know, we're not talking about sort of a random 10 people. We, we survey sort of anywhere between 60 to 80 people every single month. Um, and it varies. We, we don't just pick people in the assessment centre. We pick people that we do home consultations to. And part of the, the questionnaires that we ask of our claimants is about the appointment letter. Did they find it beneficial? How did they find the, the, the assessment centre? Were they greeted okay? Um, what, how was our health professional during that assessment? There, we, we, there is quite extensive questions that, that is done. Does it include how was your journey? Yeah, together? yeah. It does. Uh, it, it covers absolutely everything. Um, oh, I, do, I just find myself listening to you and you're talking about 97% of a survey of 60 people or maybe 80 people. And you know the statistics that we heard were that this huge proportion being overturned on appeal. Now, a survey is one thing, but actually a tribunal has sat down and weighed up the evidence and effectively said that the decision you made was wrong. Uh, so I think, just uh, before, sorry, Cam, um, uh, we don't make the decision, first and foremost. We, we make recommendations. We do the assessment. So we, yeah. we, we, you know, we but the quite, decision is based on your recommendation. We, we just, how they come to that decision and what, what, how it's scored, we don't have any input. We don't put a scoring down, we don't make any suggestion. We, we, all of our health professionals go through extensive training. Um, it is very full on. Um, the, the training they have to go through is, is a very strict criteria of clinicians that we can pick from. Um, personally, I would like to be able to pick from more. It would certainly make recruitment a lot easier for me. Um, but I think the, the, the status around stuff around tribunal and that is potentially a bit misleading because the, the, there's further stats behind that. Um, and I know it's something that the DWP have is where the majority of those cases are where further medical evidence or new medical evidence has come to like that we as independent assessment services didn't have at the time. We can only code by the information that is presented to us at the time in terms of medical evidence and what the claimant explains to us. That's how we can base the assessment. We can't foresee new medical evidence. I don't believe it is something the DWP are, are working on. Yeah, it probably just come in there, Chair. Um, we are trying to make sure that our customers, you know, do try and provide all the necessary information, evidence up front when they're making an application. Um, 
you know, we're tending to find that a number of those appeals that are being overturned are because <coughs> evidence has been provided at the latter stage. What we want to try and make sure, uh, from, from a point of view of entitlement, is to make sure that the right decision is made at the right time, which is at the beginning stage of an application. Um, there is a mandatory reconsideration uh, stage that's involved as well on any decision that our customers dispute. And again, there, you know, there, there seems to be that our customers don't provide that, all that necessary information at that stage. So the next stage would be to go ahead and appeal. Um, you know, we are trying to make sure that a lot of our, or a number of all our third party sectors are involved or support our customers with the PIP application forms are fully aware that evidence criteria is really important, you know, as soon as a claim is being put in, so it comes with the claim, so that the right decision can be made. So the number of uh, decisions that have been turned around are really because the, uh, uh, the information or the evidence is provided at that later stage, and we're trying to get away from that. There is some notifications now that from our tribunal services, they are beginning to have that dialogue with independent assessment services as well, so they begin to all start to be more aware as to what information is being provided there, so that we can then be told that we need to obviously look at that in hindsight and make sure that, that information is delivered up front and not at the latter stage. This brings me back to a point I made last time, which is that um, if you are getting such a high proportion overturned on appeal, that's costing us as taxpayers a huge amount of money in addition to all the stress and anxiety of people who lose their benefits and, and the consequences of that can be catastrophic. And you know, whoever let this contract with the DWP should have built in a, 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 a section that said that if Atos get it wrong, consistently that they actually pay a penalty because I think if they had skin in the game and I used that term last time they would get it right first time if it costs them money um, if they had the uh, decisions being overturned on appeal then it wouldn't happen it would disappear and surely it's not beyond the wit of people at the DWP to actually organize a contract in that way it just it, again it astonishes me that they Please give them thought to how we can save the taxpayer money as well as all the stress involved with this. No, point taken, uh, Chair. You know, we we are doing everything um, you know there to make, try and make sure, as I say, you know, the right decisions being made. You know, um, what you have been uh, adhering to is it, something that needs to be escalated to our policy teams for them to really look at that, that area. And again, you know, I'm happy to sort of escalate that to our, our policy team for them to sort of consider that as well, because yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it is about making sure that the taxpayer is protected here. So something that just one, one final point from me, if I may. And you mentioned that all your rooms are uh, accessible, and, and they're on the ground floor in the centre in, in Vauxhall. Yeah. According to this note, it says we consultations rooms are on the ground first and second floor. We do not have a lift. Please inform us uh, should you not be able to climb stairs. So there seems to be a contradiction there. So in the Vauxhall we have what we call a back office uh, function, um, but all of our assessments take place on the ground floor. Um, so the back office function is where we do our audits or reports, where we do our paper based reports, um, and so this description is inaccurate, is it? So the reason why it's in there because it has caused some confusion in the past where we've had... Oh, it's Croydon this one, sorry. Uh, Croydon is um, part of our supply chain um, partner, so that, that is something I can take away with them because that's um, something I can pick up with them separately. Um, but all of our sites um, for, for London um, that have come under directly under IRS, um, IAS, sorry, don't have anything on above the ground floor. Everything is ground floor. Well, Croydon does. Croydon is a PFAS site, um, so it, it's a company that's contracted into us. Um, they Who moved... managed the contract? Sorry? Who let the contract to them? Who let it? Uh, so we find an area that we can't necessarily always provide resource to, yeah. um, so they offered to provide assistance. So they still have to adhere to the training and, and all the clinical requirements, um, and then they're governed by mm. us. So, you let them have rooms 
but they're not accessible. I, I don't know the, the Korean site, if I'm being perfectly honest, uh, but I'm more than happy to take that away and I can speak with our supply chain manager um, to, to look into that and, and get that updated accordingly. Okay. Lionel. Thank you for talking um, so returning back a little bit to the, the, the whole nice minutes thing, I, and I appreciate the explanation that if postcode goes in and it looks to be close, it's then the next, then the next, and the cut off point is 90 minutes. And if they can't get an appointment within 90 minutes travel time, it goes up somewhere, and you have to deal with that some other way. My suggestion, though, is that cut off point should come down to 60 minutes. And if that happens, then more customers, as you call them, more people will not be able to get an appointment and therefore maybe you'll have to invest in more centres, more accessible centres, more staff and actually fund this service. Because as Peter was talking earlier about saving taxpayers money, the whole PIP system is devised by government to save money, to take cash out of the hands of disabled people. You are the people who are implementing it and even that's being underfunded and done on the cheap. Because for the amount you bid for this contract to deliver the assessment services, you can't do it without sending people 90 minutes across London. The whole system is a failure and it needs to be scrapped. This government was supposedly the end of austerity. It's still going on. Look at our council budgets and look at this contract. Disabled people are having money taken out of their pockets. You're doing the job of the government who are instructing you to do that job. And it absolutely stinks. All of it stinks. <laughs> So I think it's worth saying that um, we, as I said earlier, have an advice and advocacy service. Um, benefits, and in particular PIP, is about half of our casework. Um, and we identified particular issues around PIP um, a couple of years ago. We, we've sort of been um, discussing with, with scrutiny and, and sort of very much welcome the opportunity to kind of talk about what's happening on the ground to disabled Merton residents in terms of PIP. And, and we've been having this discussion since 2016, really. Um, you, you know, it's been raised in Parliament by the local MP. Um, there have been a number of meetings. So we, we produced a report in March, and I just want to remind everyone what that found. It said that assessment centres were inaccessible. We've talked about that a bit today. It said that assessment centres were being overbooked, and it said that the assessments were inaccurate. Um, and I think if I could just focus on the inaccessibility point for a moment, um, I mean, there, there was some talk of Wandsworth, it's something that you've alluded to in, in, in your report, um, you, you know, and I think it's worth saying that, that centre of the filaments is incredibly difficult to find. You've said in your report that you've improved signage. Our caseworkers are saying that it is still very difficult to find, and one of the primary issues is that parking, available parking, is really, you know, it's over 100 metres away. Now, if you can walk more than 20, you're, you're already halfway to lose your benefit. So there, there, there's a significant issue, and um, people are being told, um, you know, oh, you, you can get dropped off, but actually at the moment, a lot of the access to, to, to the road that you're on is, is, is blocked because building works. There are a number of issues. Other access issues um, going on there at the moment are, are things like, um, you know, in October the accessible toilet was broken. People were being told to use the toilet across the road in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's simply not not, access, not acceptable. And it's not acceptable particularly within the context of people still having very long wait times. So when we talk about the centres being overbooked, one of the things you've done in your analysis is talk about people who are being sent home unseen. And, and, and you know, that is really not the only issue or the only consequence of, of overbooking. What's happening is that people are waiting for really very long periods. Um, so even though you're saying those wait times are, are reducing, actually when people are waiting for long periods of time and, and we're really looking at things, you know, 45 minutes plus, um, those aren't acceptable wait times when you're dealing with a population who, who are disabled, who perhaps have chronic pain, who, who have other issues. So one of our um, staff was, was, was at the um, Wandsworth Centre in August and observed a gentleman lying on the floor for 30 minutes because he was unable to sit on the chairs because they were so uncomfortable for him. I find that totally inappropriate in, in terms of you know how, how people are being treated. And he did say, you know, the reception staff tried their best, but, but the point is, is that the individual shouldn't, simply shouldn't be in, in that situation. 
And one of the things that we're finding as an emerging issue is that actually we're seeing home visits being refused um, on an increasing basis now. And, and of course, home visits is the thing that would resolve a lot of these issues because actually for people who are struggling to get to the centres because they're inaccessible, home visiting is the answer. That's what the service is there for. And yet we're seeing people being refused. I um, got a copy of somebody's doctor's letter. So the doctor wrote... Um, you know, and, and this was submitted as part of the, the initial application, and they were saying, this is to certify that, in my opinion, the above named is suffering from severe anxiety and depression, panic attacks, social phobias, unable to get out of the house, and has chronic back pain. And, and the response is, one of our health professionals has looked at the information you've sent, um, and after doing this, we've decided that we need to see you face to face. And I, I just don't see... Again, how, how community that can be the situation or how that can be considered um, an, an appropriate way to, to treat people. Um, you know, and, and, and just on the point of people being sent home, you know, I looked at the figures. Wonderful that, that, that the percentage of people being sent home is, is reducing, but I would still like to see that in cold hard numbers. How many people is that still being sent home? Because again, when one of my team was there in August, um, they were there at one o'clock, people were already being turned away at that point. So, you know, maybe one, two, three percent, but that's still going to be a large volume of people. And actually, you know, you compare um, that approach, the overlooking approach to the NHS. But, I, you know, I've, I've never heard of a situation where you're at the GP surgery for a booked appointment and you get sent home again. I mean, it may be the case that that, that has occasionally happened, but certainly like, it's never, never something I've come across. And I, I, I just don't see how even a couple of percent can be considered appropriate. You know, people have struggled all that way to the centre and, and then, are being, then are being sent home. Um, you know, just as a side note, people are struggling to get all their other access needs met as well, so they're being told they can't record the assessments. So say, um, you, you know, just recently I supported somebody in my personal life, didn't even do it as <laughs> Merton Seal. And, you know, because they needed somebody with them because they weren't able to take notes themselves of what was being discussed and, and they were being told that they weren't allowed to record it on, on their sort of normal digital recorder which is what they would use for normal access needs that they have to get an a, a, a old style cassette tape double double tape system yeah, you can't, it's ridiculous it's absolutely ridiculous approach um you, you know so, so there are really a whole number of issues and, and I think one of the things that, that we've been asking, you know, the meetings being facilitated by, by Peter is, you know, that we need to know why people have been sent so far afield and that review hasn't been done in your report and I know you're saying, well, tell us who it was that was sent to Barking but you've already confirmed that Barking is within your range so you've already confirmed that it can happen because it is, it is within your range of, of where to send people from Merton. So it's a good point. I don't need to go and you know, dig out some of these permissions and double check that I can give it's just It's not feasible. You've already said barking is a possibility and I think we need to be taking places like barking out of scope. You know, we asked you to look at the refusal rates and it, all it says in the report is, oh, where have these figures come from? Well, it was in our March, it was in our March report. We've carefully evidenced it. We've used BWP's own data from Stat Explore. And, and, you know, the response from, from you guys says, well, um, you have to log into Stat Explore to use it. You don't. You don't. You log in as a guest. That's what we did. You don't need password. You don't need anything. All that information is publicly available. And, you know, if you had questions on where those figures came from, you could have spoken to us. You know, we wrote to you in July, um, you know, asked for an update. There's just been zero communication. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty shocked, really, that, that there's just not been any attempt to, to look at really what's going on in Merton. There is a significantly, statistically higher refusal rate in Merton, and that needs to be addressed. And we think it's to do with the assessment centres. There's, there's none within the borough itself, but we can't be sure. And I think that's a question for, for you guys to be answering. And, you know, Peter asked about the cost. I can tell you what the costs are. The cost to us as an agency to go into appeal is £1,200 per appeal. That is just not how we should be spending our money. The cost of the tribunal service is nearly £550 per, per appeal. It's just not an appropriate way to, to be spending money. And I think to suggest it's because there's lots of new evidence, well, that's not our experience on the ground. Our experience is that it's all the same evidence, but it's the fact that somebody's actually being heard 
and listen to, and what they're saying is, is being taken on board. That's our experience, because we as an agency will not be wasting £1,200 by, by not getting people to submit all of the evidence at the very start. That's what we do, that's how we operate. Um, you know, and, and, and I think just to wrap up a little, because I've gone on a little bit, but, you know, we, we again, we're following up, you know, this idea, we, we, we would love to come in and do a peer audit, and um, Maria agreed that we could, but then, you know, we've written again in July, there's been no uh, follow-up on that, you're saying, yes, you can come, okay, well, we'll, we'll let us come. We, we want to come and audit, we want to audit Wandsworth, we want to audit Croydon, and I think to be saying in a report that, oh, yes, Croydon's a little small, but a wheelchair will fit, well, this is a picture of the waiting room. And the only way you're getting a wheelchair into that waiting room is to take those chairs out. So what are you going to do with the people already waiting there? And, and the idea that you would potentially get people already sitting there to move and go and stand somewhere else so that you can fit a wheelchair in there is so humiliating to the individual. Again, it's, it, it's just, I think, that level of understanding of, of, of the population that you're dealing with and, and how to deal and approach people sensitively. And, and it just, you know, it just doesn't feel like it's, it's there. And it's, it is really quite disappointing, you know, and there was a comment in there somewhere, oh, you need to tell us about individual issues. What, what I said in May was, do you know what we don't? We've given you case studies, we've given you data, we've told you where we think the issues lie, we, we've told you what the emerging trends are, and you need to respect us as a voluntary sector partner to be saying these are what the problems are. You know, you're, you're, I can see you shaking your head, but you know, you're, you're sort of saying, oh, tell me about the individual people. But that's so that you can look at each individual case and go, oh no, but there's a reason for that one. There's a reason for that one. This is why that one happened. But we're asking you to look at the overall trend because that is incredibly clear. Thank you. Can I just say that I, I heard this question of can we do this assessment? And one of the most disappointing aspects of the meeting that we had with Maria Monaghan was having had her there, she actually at the end of the meeting told us she no longer works in PIP, that she's gone to work for National Savings and Investment, which is part of the organisation, it's a very big organisation, so she's been, she's gone to do that and she's coming down to Merton to tell us about PIP. And we haven't, you know, she made commitments that, that um, Merton still could do those assessments of your centres and they haven't happened. You're the regional manager for the East of England. Are you going to give us an assurance that these assessments will take place now on, on your instructions? So yes yes or no? I would say it won't speak. Yeah. We've, we've done, put, put everything in place so it can take place. I've got, for me, I'm, I, from being I've got nothing to hide. Um, as a regional manager, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the service we actually offer. I know it might sound as a surprise, but I think based on what is coming to us, I think we provide a good service. Um, and, and I think overall, that's uh, followed up by the payment satisfaction surveys and, and all the other surveys that are completed, not, like I said, not by us. We don't complete them. They're, they're done externally by a completely independent company that have no affiliation to, to IES or, or the DWP. It is done remotely. Um, some of the other points that I've raised, so in terms of the comment around the face-to-face -face assessment, that's comments we would make for a home consultation as well as an assessment centre. That is working in a way where someone's requested a paper based report that's unable to go ahead because we need to do a face to face assessment. Afterwards, that may well have gone to the home consultation queue. We don't reply directly as a face to face assessment. That is appointment number one saying you've got to come in, queried it. Appointment number two, you've still got to come in, medical letter saying they're not able to do it. I appreciate that, but for us, when it comes down to booking an appointment, if a, if a claimant um, is able to attend their medical appointments, this is deemed as a medical appointment. If they're able to attend a medical appointment, it's it open to us they're able to attend their PIP assessment. Um, I know there's been some comments around, we ask people to walk X amount of distances. We don't factor that into our assessment. The assessment begins when the claimant is called into the, from the waiting room. That's when the assessment begins. We don't look at where someone's travelled from, but we don't take that into consideration. We don't sit down and analyse if someone's parked 100 metres away, 200 metres away. For us, the assessment solely begins when they're called from the waiting room. That's, that's when the assessment begins. We do not take in any other information. We don't look at how people then leave. 
Um, you know, I've had comments in the past about social media, we don't take that into consideration. We solely go on the medical evidence that was presented at the time and what is displayed at the time. Uh, uh, I can't put on that to the case, but I'm just, like I said, for us, it's based on that. If they're able to attend a medical appointment outside of their home, then this is deemed as a medical appointment, so they should be able to attend this medical appointment as well. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing to say, isn't it? Because you have a home visiting service, and in the meeting that, that we had earlier this year, the home visiting service, and you yourself has mentioned it as well, Cam, is, is, is that it's there precisely to meet that need for people who are unable. And, and as we spoke about, 90 minute possible travel time. So, so, so that's what the home visiting appointment's for. And now suddenly you're saying, oh, actually, this is deemed to be a medical appointment, so if they can see their GP, who by the way might be, you know, five metres down the road, then they can come to a PIP assessment 90 minutes away. I, I just, you know, I, I find that extraordinary, I, I find it contradictory, because then why would you have home visiting as a service at all? Because you do offer it. So it's not, you know, it's not entirely, it's not an entirely logical response. But, putting that to one side, what I would very much like to see as, uh, you know, a, as a service delivery advice services, um, particularly around PIP, is one of the issues we have is that people are being given inappropriate appointments, whether it's location or, or whatever it is, or as in one case in, in one of my team who, who, you know, their own appointment that they had, they got the appointment letter on the Thursday for an appointment on Monday in Vauxhall, right? So if you're at the moment what, what the position is is that you can cancel once and I think what we're saying is actually if you're having to cancel that first time because of an access reason then you need to be allowed to have another cancellation because again as we know we're dealing with a population which is more likely to be unwell, they're more likely to have things uh, uh, occur which means that they then can't make that, that rebooked appointment and it did used to be the case that you could rebook twice so I think if, if somebody's been given an appointment which is not appropriate they, they that needs to not, if you like, use up their one rebooking. And I think that alone, if there was just one thing that, that we could do, that would certainly make a difference. So I think it, that's something that we will take the instruction on, um, because again, that's not from DWD. Mm -hmm. Are you going to tell us what the instructions will be, Cam, or are you? It's, it's, you're allowed, obviously, cancellation of appointment. Again, it's depending on what that cancellation reasons are. There will be obscure reasons that the individual is unable to attend that assessment centre. So again, it is dealt with need an individual basis, but I will refer that back to... Uh, I know they are looking at the cancellation policy as well. Okay. And you're going to agree to these assessments being done in your yeah, centre? Yeah, so I've, I've got nothing to hide. I've had numerous visit. Um, Various sites. Like for me, that there is nothing to hide. We've had people observe assessments. We've put on uh, training assessments. Yes. I think what what we're saying is, you know, we're not asking whether you've got something to hide. We, we're saying that we were given a, a, an assurance that these would take place, and nothing's happened. Yeah, so I, I appreciate that. I, I'm not aware of those assurances. I'm being perfectly honest, and I've been the regional manager for a year now. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that away. What, um, just one other aspect I'd like to comment on is the payment sent home on scene. So I know you mentioned the percentages and, and you know we are working very hard to continue to bring them down, but what you also take consideration part of those percentages are stuff that are completely out of our control. So part of the percentage of people that haven't met the IDV requirements to continue with the assessment, um, or they haven't requested a, a special requirement from us prior to the assessment, BSL being the key one, that will build up part of that percentage. So I'm more than happy to, to, to break it down um, in, in what we look at in terms of there's service level affecting, so ones that are, are within our control and, and non-service level affecting, um, that is a combined percentage of the two. Um, so it, it, it doesn't give the full picture. I, I imagine from your perspective you would rather understand the ones that are in our control, which for us is, is coming down extremely low um, to the point where every site I had in London for October was under 1% for ones that were in our control. So I, I think we are working tirelessly. We do have an overbooking policy. Um, it is a daily one. Um, I understand there were some concerns around Croydon previously. Um, uh, so Croydon has been addressed, I've shared then the practice that we adopt in all IAS sites, 
and that is a daily booking policy. So we, we look at trends in attendance. Um, we don't, Wandsworth has come down dramatically, just while we've seen an improvement in our people, partly while we've seen an improvement in people being set home on seats. But I think some of the aspects we are taking further control of, and something I'm championing um, from my aspect is the courtesy calls. Um, the, the response we've had to that has, has been brilliant from our payments, and I think that's shown in what we call FTA, so that to us is failure to attend. Prior to driving these courtesy calls, and, and saying these things we've done meticulously, we need to be doing them, that, you know, we've got to be driving them. Prior to doing these calls, that FTA was around, on average, 15% a day, wouldn't turn up, and wouldn't give us any contact. Um, and we send them my text messages where there's mobile numbers, we obviously send them great letters. You know, I appreciate it may not arrive on time, um, or as we like, we always send out a minimum of 19 days prior to the appointment. What happens within Royal Mail after that, I can't fully comment. We are continuously doing dip checks internally and making sure that everything's going out and our system is producing the letters and they are going out straight away. Um, where it's short notice, then we'll agree it over the phone. So anything that's less than 19 days is agreed over the phone. It's not system booked, it's not system generated. But we will take those steps. But like just on that, it's the courtesy calls that are driving our reduction of booking policies because we're, we're taking greater control. We're not just potentially hoping that the equipment that has arrived, that they receive a text message because one thing we have got is it, it happens, people change numbers, people use mobiles, it, it does happen. We don't necessarily have sight of that. So that's why we, we're driving the courtesy calls. I was there today in Wandsworth and I was listening to the call being made in action where the people being called, reminded to bring identification because that is a real sticking point. And it is on the very front page of the equipment letter in, in the bold box and we said, please bring two forms of ID. It's still missed at times. Um, but now it's repeated when we make the phone call. So we're trying everything we can to, to encourage people to, to not only attend, but also so they can attend without potentially being sent home because they haven't met the IDV requirements. Um, but just on the FTA, you've seen it drop from roughly about 15% three months ago to now it's about 8%. But our booking policies have come down with it. Because like I said, we're, we're, we're taking complete ownership um, we're not just sitting there, like I said, waiting on you putting the letter to land or the technology to be picked up. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Oh, a couple of questions. I think the first question is, we've got these four assessment centres. How many assessments have you roughly have been done a month? Uh, a month. Um, so anywhere between, it, it depends on, on head of working need, but anywhere between six to 800 a month in each one. Uh, that's, I can't comment on the Quirin one, I, I, I don't know, I can only comment on my so, other ones. So, so about 3,000 a month? Between, uh, well between ones with Fox and Barking, it would be between six eight hundred a month between those three, because they're very large sites. Okay, but my point is really that if on the statistics on page 81, you've got an average just under 4% I calculated, sent home, in that quarter, that's got to be in the region of 500 people sent home. They've turned up for a booked appointment and then been sent to go back. <laughs> but that's why, like I said, that part of that percentage is a mixture of what's within our control and what we don't want is, is we, that's the one we want to keep as a minimum. The ones that are outside of our control, there's not much we can do if, if we haven't been given prior notice that a BSL is required. Um, because it has been times where you know, no matter uh, sign language. So obviously, if, if nothing has been requested, then there's, and they arrive at the assessment, it's kind of out of our control. Again, if, if people fail the IPV checks, that all feeds into the payment that's sent home on scene. Um, it is a combined of what's in our control and what's outside of control. This is more of a common question. I, I just think they're approaching this whole thing totally wrong. It seems to me that these are vulnerable people, many with disabilities. They are desperate to receive their personal independent payments. And yet we're talking about things that they've done wrong. And we are not informed that they need BSL. Well, surely these people aren't coming for the first time. 
they're on the system, the system you talked about having very secure measures to protect personal data. So not coming cold off the street. I just find this whole approach very upsetting. Now, in terms of what was said about Merton Sill visiting some of these centres, I think it's absolutely essential they should be allowed to visit. And I would like to suggest that maybe we have um, a, a council officer accompany Merton Sill representatives on these visits so we can get a report back from our officers. I don't know if we can make that as a recommendation, Chair. Like I said, I'm not really fussed in. No, I'm not really fussed in terms of if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, it will obviously need to be planned in, um, but yeah, like I said, I'm not really fussed in. Just to sort of continue with that point that gentleman's just made, um, yeah, when, especially when I'm going out there doing sort of awareness sessions, I'm doing sessions around PIP and the application form. I do stress to our third party delegates that it's really important to try and build a picture of what their needs are at the assessment centre. So if it means particularly that somebody has any sort of issues around um, sensory impairment, be it cell issues, you know, anything like that, that it's made aware on their application form. And also when they actually get their appointment letter, um, if they're able to, or when they're a member of family next to King, they can actually call just to sort of make sure of what the needs are for the individual. My point is, if they need a DSL interpreter and they've been caught, they'll need the one. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I would think you'll find that the majority of the cases we deal with are new referrals. Mm -hmm. So they, they will be new to us. That is the, the, the majority of the yeah. assessments we do, because PIP is still early in, in, in terms of a benefit. But haven't they been on other benefits? Right, the, systems, the systems, as far as I'm aware, don't yeah. read like that. No. No, the PIP, the PIP uh, system is, is totally different to the old DLA system. Again, with the PIP application form, they can use any medical evidence that's obtained with their DLA uh, claim previously. So we do need to make sure that our customers are aware that they consent to uh, any evidence on the DLA claim to be used as part of the PIP application as well. So any subsequent information on the DLA claim it is looked at. So again, you know, our customers need to be educated with that to make sure that they can consent to that as well. So, what we were agreeing... Sorry, I've got one more question. Okay, it's quite brief. Um, uh, there, there are many, many things I can pick up on. But I've got a particular question for uh, from IAS about home visits. Um, do you... Uh, I'm assuming that a home visit, obviously, because of staff time and travel time, and the, the travel itself costs more. So do you have a limit on the amount of home visits you're allowed to offer, or a target of how many home visits you can offer? Or more, more specifically, do, um, is, do you have a, can you just give a home visit to everyone who you decide might need one? Or do you, do you have a limit of the number you can offer in any month or week, or any period? Short sure answer, there is no limit. <laughs> there isn't. <laughs> It, 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 for everyone who needs one at home, visit the limit can't afford it. That, that's what the limit we've got. So we don't get involved in terms of its costs, and we can't judge that and, and govern that. We, we, we can't predict. You know, this is a, a benefit that people that are in work can also be claiming. For us, we you know the, we, we follow the guidelines that are set out. You know, this is what's required for a home assessment. We're not here to that. If that needs to change, that's something we're more than happy to work with the DWP on and look into. There isn't a set limit. The limit is at basically how many we've got to do that month. There isn't saying, well, we can only do this amount because of cost. That doesn't come into it. Okay, so what proportion are given home visits at the moment? So in terms of our face-to-face -face assessment, so home based reports is, is roughly about 15%. Um, you're then looking at a further, it, 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 it fluctuates, but you're probably looking at a further 60% will be in the assessment centre, um, and then the remaining percent um, will be in home consultation. So but it, it, it fluctuates month on month. So it's 25%? Roughly. Visits. Yeah, it can go up and down. Yeah, they, you know, there's some, it, they, because these new referrals and cases are coming through, we can have some months where we see a spike, and if we see a spike, we plan on a monthly basis. So we, when we create our, 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 our targets, it's based on, right, 
this is how many people we need to see in the home consultations based on the medical evidence and what's been scrutinised at the very beginning. So I need to make sure, working with my sites, that we're putting out enough resource in the home consultation space to get those people seen. That's how it's worked. We don't then look at it and go, but actually, we can only afford to do 100. It's not, it, it, it doesn't work like that. On average, in London, we probably see about 500 people a, a month in the home consultation. I still think we're sending about 500 people yeah. home a month yeah. than having had appointments, you know, timed appointments with them, which I think is just, you know, not right. The other point just occurs to me that you talked earlier about a pop-up centre in Burton and you said it was important that the building was vetted and IT arrangements made. But if we are doing 500 home visits a month, isn't a pop-up centre really just a succession of home visits. If we approach it with that mindset, we can simply say to people, we're originally popping into this building and conducting assessments, just let me pop into your home and conduct assessments. It, it wouldn't be if everyone lived that close together. The problem is when we do, do London is a, a vast area and our, you know my HPs will see no more than three in the home consultation space, but we'd expect them to travel up to two hours in total. No, no so we'll ask our staff to travel two, two hours. Um, our staff will say to them to travel up to two hours in, in, in the day to, to complete those three mm -hmm. assessments. That should give you enough time to make an adequate assessment and, and submit uh, uh, an adequate high level report. Um, we are graded on them at, at, at an independent level um, and, and they are very steep service credits associated with them. So, from our perspective, it is paramount that we get the quality right um, as because the, the service credits that are associated with so I appreciate the comments around the tribunal, but again, at the, when the reports are audited at that stage, based on the medical evidence that was there and, and that report, it is deemed as that is a, a good quality report. That can change. I'm not saying that is 100% accurate, not at all, but I've, that I am aware, and I think the DWP are working on getting some comms out about the, the, the tribunal side of things, because I think there is a, 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 a misunderstanding about appeals and, and what's happened based on what's been presented afterwards that wasn't available at the time. Um, and, and we are, we as the IAS are actually going out there with disability rights groups, and, and you know I'm sending my managers out to them to, to speak to them to really encourage giving us this information as soon as possible. Um, we've had people openly tell us they're not going to provide this information and going to hold it until a until appeal. Um, we, we've had people openly tell us that. Because they, they feel like they... For months. Yeah? And um, they starve and they go out of the food bank. Lose their car. Lose their home. Yeah, we, we've had people openly say to us that they're not going to do that. Um, and then not going to fly. But it's, I'm not saying that's everybody I say, but it does happen. I don't want to get down into the very, you know, the, the small percentage. Like the overall majority of our claimants are, are very compliant and, 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 and work with us. We do have instances of, can be quite scary circumstances. Um, you know, we've seen recently a spike in incidents in, in our assessment centres. And, and, and we're working no. on that. <laughs> is that like born out of frustration? Um, I, I think some of it, if I'm being honest, is, is a misunderstanding of Pip and DLA. Um, mm. But overall, it doesn't condone some of the, the, the acts that have gone on in our assessment centres. You know, we, we want to treat people with respect and we expect our, our staff to be treated that way. But some of the stuff that has happened of late hasn't gone quite like that, which is, you know, disappointing, but, you know, I'll work with my, my staff to make sure that, that they can kind of dust themselves down and, and, and go again. But like I said, the overall majority of our claimants are compliant and willing to, to, to work with us and, 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 and make this process as smooth as possible. We want to make it as smooth as possible. When we get a claim from the DWP, we've got 40 days to get that back to them. I'm going to draw this to a point. 
different conclusion. Thank you, Jeff. It strikes me there's almost a kind of small data, big data problem here. Because we've asked for some big data analysis and it hasn't been forthcoming, but I think we should still know how many um, customers or claimants from Merton are going to each of these assessment centres. And I think we should know how many of the Merton customers are sent back having asked for a timed appointment and given one. Because the thing is that there is no assessment centre in Merton. No. So that's not satisfactory. And I think we need to get some data analysis so we can see what's going on. The other bit of data analysis I would very much like to see is the norm normalization curve for appeals. It seems to me with the volume of assessments, 3,000 a month, and the successful number of appeals, 87%, we will see that on average an assessor has X number of appeals found against that assessor. And I would like to know what the outliers are. Have we got assessors who, for one reason or another, are often have appeals successful against them? And if they do, what action is being done to retrain those assessors so that their appeal rate comes down to the average? We asked that at the, the last meeting right. that we had. Is, are all those statistics available? So, for us, this is something we've gone back to the DWP and we work on because we don't get any. Once that report's left us, we don't know anything after that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We couldn't. I couldn't tell you if it's gone to appeal and and what that outcome was and why. I don't. We don't have sight of that. Why? I, I don't know. That's not in their contract. Their contract is purely for the assessment. Don't you right? want them to do a better job? So yeah. If 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 you've got somebody who's consistently getting it right, don't you need him to be training? His colleagues to yeah, consistently yeah. get it right. And if somebody's consistently getting it wrong, doesn't somebody need to? IAS have um, they do check percentages of their assessments to make sure that a full assessment, accurate assessment, has been done. That, that's their part of the uh, the brief. The decision is totally done by the decision maker with relation to all the information that's been provided. So that's where. If the relevant decision hasn't taken place because there's been a lack of evidence or clarity, <coughs> um, then it's gone forward for the matter in consideration. I appreciate where you're coming from here. If it's something that I can obviously push up to our program team to see that they can look at that, I will do so. Okay. Well, I think we do need to try to a conclusion. I'm, I'm struck with all this discussion uh, from one of the people that we heard at the very beginning of this process, his name is Jeremy Gabelli, who came in and told us his experience of applying for PIP. And this man was not a scrounger, he was a man who worked hard all his life. He had an accident in the workplace, as I recall, and subsequently was involved in a car crash. So he had, you know, two unfortunate acts happened to him. And he was applying for the benefits that he was entitled to because having worked hard all his life and paid his taxes and his national insurance, he was entitled for support at that time. And yet there's this sense that such people are scroungers. And you know, I got to know the man because he was once one of my constituents and um, and you know, at the time he was applying his wife was seriously ill and I think she died during that process. And his experience of what you were delivering, what your staff were delivering, was appalling. And that is what kind of motivates me to want to make this better. And I'd, I'd appeal to you to do what you can to make it better. We are not going away. We will come back to this issue and we will hold you to account because that's our job. Uh, and if we feel that uh, disabled people from Burton are not being treated well, we will let you know about it. And we would. I mean, one of the things that I think is, I, mean, I understand, Cam, you're off now. So Maria Monaghan, when she came to see us, told us at the end that she was going. Uh, I think you're, you're yeah, I am gone, gone already. Yeah, I Are have. we going to see somebody different in your seat next time? Because then what we get is, I don't know what was agreed last time. Mm -hmm. So 
unless you know something I don't, <laughs> which I hope is not the case. Um, like I, I've stepped in for a, a colleague at short notice. Um, and we're very grateful. I, 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 if, if, if you want me to come back, I'm, I'm happy to come back. Um, the lady that was due to come is Maria's replacement, which is why she was due to come. I imagine she would know more of what was discussed previously. Um, I, I've been given this, I, I provided information around the London sites as requested. Um, I can't comment much further on what Maria had at the time. I think what, what, we're, what we're asking for is you're agreeing to these assessments, we're going to send. Um, well, we're not going to send, you're going to kindly go, but we'll send an officer to and we will get a report back on that uh, and we will continue to ask questions on behalf of the people that we represent. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Cabinet member priorities. Councillor Tobin Wong. Thank you. And can I start by apologising to members that I'm giving this update so late in the year. Um, I think the first scrutiny meeting crashed with Cabinet, and then the last one I had to address a meeting on St Elliot Hospital, so that was felt to be a priority. I just want to set out a little bit of context, and some of it Hannah touched on earlier. So nationally, social care spending, including children's social care, was 54.4% of overall service spend by local authorities in 1617, and that was up from 45.3% in 2010 11. We know there's a large funding shortfall in adult social care. So the King's Fund puts it at 2.5 billion, the LGA puts it at 2.5 billion, rising to 3.5 billion by 2025, and the Competition and Markets Authority estimates that on top of this, the care home market is underfunded by around £1 billion per year. And based on Merton's share of the settlement funding assessment, overall this would equate to a shortfall for Merton of around 6.6 .6 million, rising to 9.3 million by 2025. The direct has already touched on the forthcoming Green Paper, and we know that it's expected to focus on the long-term solutions for funding adult social care at a time of unprecedented growth in older populations and solutions beyond the £2 billion that has already been pledged. And in Merton, we needed to deliver significant new money into the system. We have a very diverse and growing population. So in 2018, we have an estimated population of 210,250, and that's projected to increase to 217,550 by 2025. And within this, the age profile is predicted to shift, with notable growth in the proportions under 16 and over 50. As Hannah said earlier, 43% of the overall council budget is allocated to community and housing. And within this, 92% is spent on adult social care, which is the largest area of controllable spend the council has. Adult social care, as colleagues will know, had £9.3 million of growth invested into it in 2017-18. The council provides care for nearly 2,000 people every month, including older people, people with physical disabilities, people with learning disabilities, people suffering from poor mental health, and people suffering from substance misuse. Every week, on top of all the day-to-day -day work, the department deals with casework submitted by councillors, legal challenge, ombudsman referrals, deaths in the borough, and safeguarding concerns, to name just a few, all of which I am briefed on. When you throw in the other areas of the portfolio, such as public health, chairing the Health and Wellbeing Board, and the relationships with the health service, the challenges caused by the lack of a long-term sustainable solution for social care funding, and the ever-changing health landscape, it can be difficult to focus on priorities without getting tied down in operational matters. And in preparing for this evening, it struck me that given the diversity of the portfolio, there are any number of individual aspects which I would regard as a priority. Examples would include the implementation of the Air Quality Action Plan, the continuation of our journey towards becoming fully dementia friendly, following the award we were given by the Alzheimer's Society a few months ago, 
fighting for the best health facilities for residents, including the redevelopment of the Wilson Hospital and the retention of St. Helier Hospital, getting people out of hospital more quickly and enabling them to stay at home for longer, and ensuring decisions around social care follow the strict guidance of the Care Act. However, there are also a number of overarching themes which bind many of these individual priorities together, and I thought it might be more useful to briefly touch on four of these themes and cite some of the specific priorities within each, namely bridging the gap, sustainability, prevention, and partnership working. So firstly, bridging the gap. This has been a strategic priority for the Council for a number of years, but is perhaps more relevant to my portfolio than some of the others. The Director of Public Health undertook an important piece of work earlier this year in her annual public health report, which sought to set out the complex picture of deprivation across the borough, and particularly the inequalities that exist between the East and the West. This found, among other things, that the gap in life expectancy between the richest parts of our borough and the most deprived is 3.4 years for women and 6.2 years for men. Bridging the gap drives much of the work we do, particularly in public health, from the East Merton model of health and wellbeing and work on the Wilson Hospital being undertaken with the CCG, to our support for St Helier Hospital, which serves residents in one of the most deprived parts of the borough. The Council has had a clear line on St Helier Hospital for many years, most recently in September last year, where a motion was agreed unanimously at full Council. And we will continue to do everything we can to keep St Helier on its current site and to get at the investment it so badly needs in this latest attempt to downgrade it. Secondly, sustainability. And there are several aspects to this. So at a national level, we need a long-term funding solution to ensure that social care is sustainable for local authorities, and that's why we submitted a response to the LGA's own green paper on social care funding, and will continue to make representations at a national level. But as we discussed earlier, we also need to ensure our own budget is sustainable, and that means both a disciplined approach to managing the budget on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as taking some difficult decisions over the next four years to ensure that the resources we do have are targeted towards those most in need. The third element of sustainability is within the care sector itself. We know that the market remains extremely fragile for home care providers and for care homes, so we need to work closely with them to ensure that they are sustainable, otherwise it is our residents who will suffer and it is us who have to pick up the cost of provider failure. Thirdly, prevention which is something that is increasingly difficult to invest in given the financial constraints that have been imposed upon us. So what can we do? Well, through the Health and Wellbeing Board, working closely with the CCG and other partners, we've sought to address some of the bigger issues, such as childhood obesity and diabetes, both of which have a huge cost to the state if not prevented. But smaller, initi smaller initiatives can have a big impact too, like the funding of lunch clubs, which provide hot food and good company to people who might otherwise have neither, or the befriending service we commissioned through Age UK and Wimbledon Guild to help combat loneliness and social isolation. We can do more of this by pooling funds and working collaboratively, which is why we are currently mapping all initiatives undertaken by ourselves, the CCG and the voluntary sector to see what duplication, if any, exists and how we might target resources better. And that brings me to my fourth theme, partnership working. Partnership working starts in the council itself. The health and well-being of our residents is affected by many things, many of which the council has some degree of control over, but a lot of which do not sit either in my portfolio or in community and housing. That's one of the reasons the council introduced health in all policies last year, ensuring every decision we take is done with the health and well-being of the borough in mind, and is why the Director for Environment and Regeneration not only sits on the Health and Wellbeing Board, but plays a very active role on it. Examples of this collaborative approach are the Air Quality Action Plan, which sits in my portfolio even though many of the initiatives to tackle poor air quality sit in Environment and Regeneration, and the paper due to go to Cabinet next week looking at a strategic approach to parking, designed at reducing car usage to improve both air quality and to get people more active. 
Outside of the council, it means working closely with the users of our services, like through the Learning Disability Forum, which I reintroduced when I became Covenant member two and a half years ago. It also means a close working relationship with the voluntary sector. We are currently inviting bids on our strategic grant programme, and Cabinet chose to keep the level of funding the same, despite the challenges that exist. The programme was co-designed with the voluntary sector, with the Director of Community and Housing co-chairing a number of workshops with the Chief Executive of the CAB, and I know that we can do far more together by working more collaboratively and better targeting our resources. Finally, it means maintaining close working relationships with our health colleagues in the CCG. It is through these relationships that we have undertaken a lot of good work on the Health and Wellbeing Board, and that meant we were the best performing borough for delayed transfers of care last winter. The relationship will become more important as the drive towards integration from government increases, but it will also become more difficult to sustain as funding decreases and as the decisions are taken which we might disagree on. We have recently set up Merchant Health and Care Together, which brings together the Council, providers and the CCG and reports into the Health and Wellbeing Board. And it is imperative both that we have a strong voice on that board, but equally that we maintain close working relationships with our colleagues in the health sector, even when we disagree. So those are a few of the themes uh, which underpin a number of the priorities that the department is working on. I'm very happy to take questions if members have any. Thank you, Tony. Are there any questions? Stephen. It's in the form of a comment than a question, actually. I, I, I just like to say, I think you have one of the most difficult and challenging portfolios that any councillor can expect to have. And on the whole, I, I think you're doing a pretty good job. I wish you well. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a kicker coming. <laughs> um, I'm not really actually getting a sense of priorities because I do accept that resources are scarce. We could always do with some more money. We'd always like to do a lot more to help our residents, etc. But to my mind, in a situation like that, what matters is depend deciding between your priorities. And the key kind of question is, what might be your lowest priority, which you might take money or resource away from, in order to give to your top priority, which would benefit from that money or resource? And my sense is that we've got all these priorities and we're struggling to do a bit better in each one. And I just wonder if you could give us any sense of which priorities you might take money and resource from and which priorities you might give it to so we get more a sense of what are really the priorities that you think matter to our residents and what we should be doing about them. Well there's a nice easy question to begin with. <laughs> I think it's incredibly difficult on the social care side to talk about priorities because we are so constrained not only by um, the funding, but also by the Care Act, which tells us what we have to do. So the director um, has to ensure that the department is following the Care Act, and there is very little leeway for members to involve themselves in that process. In terms of how we spend the money that we have available to us, um, we have to ensure that we are meeting our statutory requirements. I think on the public health side, there's a little bit more scope, but that scope is only going to exist by working collaboratively. So I think some of the things that we've done through the Health and Wellbeing Board, where we've had a priority um, for each year, so two years ago, my first year um, as cabinet member, it was childhood obesity and social prescribing. That led to the social prescribing pilot in the east of the borough and that subsequently led to the CCG rolling out social prescribing in every GP surgery in the East and now looking at trialling it in the West. Um, so uh, childhood obesity led to an action plan that was agreed between Cabinet and the CCG's governing body and again has led to a number of policies. This year we've had um, diabetes, so we had a programme called the Diabetes Truth Commission where every health and wellbeing member was paired with um, what we termed an expert witness, who was someone 
either suffering from type 1 or type 2 diabetes, um, diagnosed as a pre-diabetic or caring for someone with diabetes. Health and Wellbeing Board members spent a couple of months meeting their buddy to understand um, some of the factors which might have led them to become diabetic in the first place and what either the, the council or the CCG could have put in place to help them prevent becoming um, diabetic. And that's subsequently leading to a framework which again will be agreed um, between the council and the CCG, um, which should lead to better outcomes for residents. Um, the Wilson Hospital is another priority for the Health and Wellbeing Board. And again, it's working collaboratively. And I think that the, the underlying message here is that we have a very limited pool of money available to us. Um, we have a large number of responsibilities and we have rising demands. So it's very difficult to target that resource. And actually, we need to work not only with our health colleagues, but also with our voluntary sector partners in order to maximise what we get out of that money. Thank you. Any other? Sally. Sorry, but you know you expect me to ask something about this. Um, you mentioned St. Kelly Hospital, and these are my opinions, and I could be wrong, but it is fantastic that Hold of Merton Council voted to support keeping St. Kelly as it is. It's very noticeable Sutton Council is exceedingly quiet about it and we went to the same meeting in Sutton to try and make support a more active approach in that area. And one of the things that concerns me is that I think Sutton, this is my opinion, I could be wrong, would love the school, the new hospital with the Royal Marsden all clustered together as a sort of showpiece. But we had the um, Nuffield Trust do the deprivation report. How much weight will the Trust give to considering that element? Because St. Helier supports a huge deprived area more than the other two hospitals, the other hospital, Epsom or the new one would. And also the location issue, how much are they putting on that? Because before it was thrown out at being in the Bannisted area on the Sutton site, the Belmont site, because it would involve compulsory purchase of property and the infrastructure is not there to support the construction of a hospital. So that would have to be factored in for compulsory purchase costs, etc. And my concern is is the trust giving enough weight to these two issues that would support the better value for money and need retaining St. Helier rather than building a brand new hospital? Thank you. Um, so firstly, just on the decision-making process, it's not the trust that's making the decision, it's the commissioners. So it's um, Merton, Sutton and Surrey Down CCGs who will come together as one committee and make that decision. In, in terms of what weight they are giving to different criteria, um, I don't know because we haven't been told that yet. So two workshops have taken place, uh, one took place last week and one took place today. Um, they have been facilitated by clinicians but they have been um, comprised of residents who have put themselves forward. Um, the first workshop last week was to agree the criteria with which the options would be scored. And the second workshop today was to agree the weightings that would be ascribed to each criteria. There is a third workshop due to take place um, on the 14th, and that is due to score the options using the criteria and the weighting that have been agreed by these two workshops. Um, in terms of the deprivation impact analysis, this was something that was undertaken at the request of Merton. Um, we took advice uh, around this time last year after the Trust had engaged on its own process of, of engagement and we were told that they needed to undertake a deprivation impact analysis or someone needed to undertake one. Um, myself and the leader had a number of conversations with the CCG 
and the upshot of which was that they agreed to undertake it themselves because at one point we were looking at commissioning it through the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, our view is that the deprivation impact analysis that has been published does not do what we were promised it would do. Um, so essentially there were two parts to it. The first part was to review the evidence nationally and look at what um, what work had been done previously linking deprivation to um, the need to access acute services. The second part was then to look specifically um, at the patch that uses Epsom and St Helia um, and look at the impact there. So what they've done is they have mapped deprivation across those areas and they've shown that particularly in Merton and Sutton and the bit of Sutton that accesses St Helia there are high levels of deprivation. But what they haven't done is drill down into that data to actually understand um, the number of residents with particular conditions who need to access particular types of healthcare. Our understanding was that that would form part of the DIA. Um, we're now being told that it will not be. So we are writing to the CCG to seek some clarification around that and depending on the um, response, we may take further legal advice. Thank you. John. Thank you, Toby. Thank you for your report also. Uh, you mentioned about social prosperity, which has been taken up in the east of the borough. Can you explain to us whether or not it has been taken up in other parts of the borough? So the, the social prescribing pilot was initially um, in a couple of GP practices in the east of the borough um, and it was specifically targeted at the east of the borough because um, people were presenting with um, conditions that it was felt um, needed a non-clinical solution, if you like. Um, so the CCG funded the pilot pilot was so successful that they agreed to roll it out to every GP practice in the east of the borough. They are now looking at it, rolling it out in the west of the borough too. Um, I'm not sure what the timescales are for that, but they have made a commitment to do that. for uh, presenting uh, his priorities and we'll move on to item 9 um, which is um, for me to just um, talk to you about what's been going on uh, with the, the Josh um, <clears throat> a subcommittee of South West London and Surrey has been set up um, to consider improving healthcare together 2020 to 2030, um, which is proposing to consolidate major acute services at either Epsom Hospital, St Helia Hospital or Sutton Hospital. Um, they are currently in the pre-consultation phase with a full public consultation expected to begin in the spring 2019, although I think every time somebody talks to me about it, it seems to slip back. Um, there have been a couple of meetings. The first um, full blown uh, meeting of the committee was held here on the 16th of October, and um, NHS colleagues provided an overview of the work to date uh, and uh, the work undertaken to engage with local communities. Now, many of us attended some of those engagement exercises, and you know, one of the things that I it was a sense in which uh, the people in the community that I represent actually don't trust the people that are leading this and feel that the whole thing um, has been uh, already decided. Mm -hmm. and I think the word a stitch up comes to mind and they made that clear. I mean the people that I represent are not back with coming forward and um, telling people exactly what's what's on their mind and uh, um, it seemed to me that some of the health officials were quite taken aback when people told them that they didn't trust them and they felt that the whole thing was, uh, the, the, 
the answer was determined and it was just a question of finding the right question uh, to justify the answer that had been predetermined. Um, the other thing that I found quite disturbing was that um, there were papers, including the declaration paper, which were, um, I think, tabled the day before. It was, yeah, it was published very close to the meeting and therefore there wasn't a proper opportunity to consider it. Um, and, you know, you want to study something, you want to ask questions. And for me, this reminded me of the exercise that we had a few years ago called Better Services, Better Value, because mm -hmm. that was a constant theme. You would find that the papers were reduced at the last minute, you'd be bounced into discussing something you haven't had the chance to properly consider. And I made that point very strongly that you know, if you know, there, there is a credibility um, gap here, um, that NHS colleagues have, and you know, they're not doing themselves any favours by continuing that practice because it makes people even more uh, mistrustful of them. Um, we looked at things like the impact on other local hospitals, and you know, the question that's come up again and again at the um, consultations within local communities is if you take out any of the um, um, a and &E departments or maternity services in any of the hospitals, it will have a huge impact because all of the hospitals yeah, yeah. are currently struggling and the idea that you can kind of take one out and that it's not going to have an impact is just nonsense because you go to any of them and the queues uh, and the weights for a and &E are extraordinary. Um, and the impact on health inequalities, one of the things that you know, I was saying was um, that I felt that that really did matter and it should be given considerable weighting. And, and I also feel that, you know, um, that, that their, one of their conclusions was that um, it, it doesn't really matter to um, deprivation where you, where you cite these services. And I, I just think that's, I mean, I think I use the word, the word counterintuitive, but absolute nonsense is another way of describing it. Um, when you think about it, there's so many um, issues connected with deprivation and health uh, that are, are, are blindingly obvious. You know, if, if you've got um, elderly people who are on, on very low incomes, then they're more, more likely to be using health services. They're less likely to have access to their own transport, and therefore asking them to travel distances is going to have a, a detrimental impact on their health. Um, so I think overall, um, there is a real sense of concern from me. I think there is one of the most depressing things about the whole thing was one of the councillors from one of the other boroughs represented uh, said right at the outset that this has already been decided, it's been told where it is, and that they are, quote, just going through the motions. And I suppose, you know, I've, I've always had that view, but to hear somebody from one of the other boroughs confirm that that's their thinking too, uh, really is worrying. And you kind of wonder, you know, because we're giving up I'm certainly doing a great deal of time to make the case and to defend some areas or I'll continue to do so. I've done it for many years. But you just wonder whether you know, the, the whole thing is just a charade and um, that there is this predetermined outcome and they just need to be able to tick the box that they've gone through um, the process. Uh, and even some of them, the, you know, I think Tobin's absolutely right, what they promised us uh, on, the, on the deprivation study and what's actually emerging uh, is, is pulled apart and so I think there's, there's further evidence of bad faith. So that's a brief summary. I'm conscious of the time and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, if members have any. But I think we have to really fight and, and be on our guard and and I really do welcome the cross-party approach with this, that you know, we are 
there's, there's nothing between us on, on this issue, on this hospital. We want to retain St. Helier Hospital. I think that's going to be really important uh, going forward, that there isn't any kind of chink between the physical growth things. And, and, and you know, I think all subscribe to the view that this is an essential local resource and we must keep it. Uh, and we'll fight for it. We've fought before and we will fight again. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. okay. Go on then. Thank you. Um, oh, there's a couple of points I'd like to make, but one is a factual inaccuracy that you've just been told. Um, the, the, the man at the end, who, and I'm sorry, I apologise, I missed your name. Tommy. Um, but you actually said that the meeting that went on today and the meeting that went on last week and the third one that's coming up, you actually said that this was organised by, I think you said the CCGs, but the body, the group making these decisions were members of the public. That is not true. I am part of the stakeholders group and I have the paperwork and the, the group that are making these decisions consist of, and this is from memory, so forgive me if I'm wrong by one or two, but the group making these decisions is something like 13 members of the public with eight members of staff making the decisions. So you've got 13 people hand-picked and they're turning people away. If they've got anything to do with COSH, for instance, they've not been allowed on. Um, so it's 13 members of the public, eight members of staff, but overseeing those are something like four staff advisors advising these members of the public and they're being um, overseen by about four observers. So again, staff. So there's a vast disparity between the number of employed people whose interests are maybe a little bit um, connected or uh, conflicted and only 13 members of the public in each meeting. So it's not the public in this group, it is very much public and staff. That was a deliberate and intentional misrepresentation. Well, I don't think that is. Okay, it's wrong then. Okay. The other thing is that um, uh, the, you said that the previous engagements that several of us went to, including councillors, they have put out a report on the public's response to those engagements, and it is entirely misrepresents what I saw as the public's, rep represent, uh, public's opinion at those meetings. It would, you would conclude from the report on that that the public were largely in agreement and thought it was a great idea to lose their hospitals. That's not what I saw, and I doubt that it's what any of the councillors here saw. So have a look at, please, I ask you as a councillor to have a look at the reports and conclusions from the previous set of engagements. They are totally misleading. And if you want, I can send you the link to that report. Thank you. Um, so, are there any other questions? Okay, well, um, that uh, concludes item 9. Item 10 is the work programme. Um, is that noted? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I've kept you here so long. I think we've had some important issues to discuss, and I think there's been some really useful contributions from uh, the members. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.